surprising. Okay, so picking up where we were last time, remember we were talking about the Unix process model. And it's simple, it's like the Python of process models. It's so easy to understand and it's reasonably powerful. You can build a lot of interesting software with it. Um, remember that there's this, you know, we've, we've been talking about the concept of a process for a really long time now, actually, so I'm probably not going to belabor it any more than I have. But program in execution, so we have the context, and the context needs to be identified in some way. So we have a process ID that uniquely identifies a running program's context. And we were talking about the states of a program, and I already kind of told you this is an abstraction. We have running, stopped, and terminated, and it's certainly possible that you have many more processes running, i.e. they're in the running state if you ran top. I don't know, does anybody run top? But I mean, once in a while I do because my computer fan is on and I don't know why, and I, and I want to find out what program is consuming all the CPU cycles and causing my CPU. CPU fan to turn on because I would like my laptop to last longer than 45 minutes when it's not plugged in. So you look and you see, oh, there's like a bunch of processes that are running and uh, frequently it'll be many more than you actually have CPUs. So already we can see that this is an abstraction. But then we have running, we have stopped, which means they're not being scheduled, and we have terminated, which means that they're done. Okay, And uh, we had these different calls, fork, exit, wait, wait, pit. We talked about these last time. We haven't talked about exec or kill yet, although we've mentioned a little bit about kill, that it's a way of sending signals to another process. Okay, It's unfortunately named kill. But, uh, you know, because only one of the things that it does is kill other processes. It turns out there's like three different ways. I mean, you can send a sig quit, you can send a sig term, or a sig kill. But, um, still, there's a lot of other things we do with it, so calling it kill is a little bit of a misnomer. Okay, but we talked about some of these things. Uh, we talked about init, which is the ancestor. Remember that init is the historical ancestor process and so it's a bit anachronistic to talk about it in this class but we do because why not um, now it would be systemd if you're talking Linux or launchd if you're talking on a Mac um, and there's probably other versions of this ancestor out there as well that you could look at okay so that manages but uh, other processes in the OS and um, every operating system again goes through these states where things are being stood up so that you have this set of facilities or that set of facilities. So that's part of the reason why we still talk about init, because it's a nice, clean, simple way of explaining this phase of the operating system startup. Okay? Even though the specific details are obviously going to be changed. Now, um, one of the reasons why I'm mentioning init again is because we had this invariant that the process model in Unix had to follow. Every process has to have a parent, right? Well, except for init because it's magical. But every other process has to have a parent, and that parent has to be a running process. So what happens if I get forked off by my parent, and then my parent terminates? What do I do in that situation? Well, you can imagine that init may play a role, or process ID 1 is going to play a role in handling that circumstance. Okay. Now, we also had the uh, reality that when a process terminates, it doesn't go away right away because somebody may want to know what happened. Why did it terminate? One thing I want to make really clear is that it's not that the resources of the process hang out. Really, the only thing that hangs out when the process terminates is the termination status. That's the only thing the OS keeps around because it's not dumb. The people who write OSs aren't dumb, so they're not going to keep the entire address space and the stack space and open files and all of that junk. That would be dumb. So they reclaim all of that, but they keep around a little bit of detail about why the child process terminated. And we call it a zombie, and we reap these zombies by calling wait. Wait is the thing that says, give me this process's termination status or any child processes termination status and then that will cause that status to also be reclaimed. So it's one of those things where you can only call it once. Okay? And one of the things I like about CS124, um, I know a number of you are considering taking that in the fall, is that you actually get to implement this mechanism. So you will implement a mechanism where 
you can have child processes uh, termination status um, determ you know, or, or fetched by another process. So implementing this is uh, surprisingly challenging, it turns out. Okay, uh, any questions about any of this so far? I know this is a little bit of review. Okay. Now, um, to pick up the new material, when a child process terminates, uh, obviously the parent needs to know about it somehow so that it can actually do this step of reaping the zombie child, and uh, as any good parent should. And so the um, OS makes sure that the parent process receives a special signal indicating that the child terminated, and it's called sig child. You can see that uh, we evidently can only have one I in name, so uh, the second I in child is left out, but hey, that's how they do. So um, the default behavior is just to ignore this signal. Thankfully, if your child process terminates, it doesn't make you terminate. So um, the default behavior is just to ignore the signal. And so you can register a sig child handler and then do the thing that parents should do. And that is to wait or wait PID to reclaim that child. So um, I, this is one way to do things. I'm going to show you another model as well, and I'll try to bring this up again. Uh, if you want to have a very specific interaction with your child processes, you don't have to set up a signal handler. You can do it a different way. Um, and it turns out that uh, it's very common to do this in a slightly different way. So I'll talk about that when we get to it. But uh, you can see here we have a sig child handler. Um, same signature as always. We take an int, which is the signal number, the signal type. And we know that's going to be sig child in this case. And all we do is we wait. Now we also do a couple of other things that uh, are just for funsies. Notice we print out that we reaped a particular child with this par uh, particular process ID. Okay, so we can say which child terminated. And then we sleep for a second. Why do we sleep for a second? Well, um, again, for funsies. So uh, you'll see that this is simply there to illustrate a certain behavior of the Unix process model. Okay, so that's our sig child handler. And then we have this other code over here, which is the main function. You'll notice that the first thing we do is we register our sig child handler. Oh, that is so good. And uh, then we have a for loop, and all we do is we spin off three processes. We just spin off three child processes, and you'll notice that as long as the return value from fork is zero, now we're not doing any error checking here at all, which is uh, naughty for us, but uh, again, we're just doing this for, for illustration purposes. We fork off three children, and remember that fork returns zero for the child, so then we do the stuff inside the if body, if we're a child process, we skip it if we're the parent. We print hello, so we're, we're a friendly child process, we print hello, we print out our process ID, we sleep five seconds, and then we terminate. So return zero from main, that'll make sure that uh, whoever called, you know, whoever initial, uh, how shall I say this? Whoever started this child process, whoever's looking at the status that comes back, will see a, a termination status of zero. That's what I'm trying to spit out here. Okay, so we do this. Spin off three children, and then obviously the uh, outside of the for loop will never get to it uh, if we're the child, but we will get to it if we're the parent. And so the parent is just going to sit here in a little infinite pause loop to uh, watch for children to terminate. Okay? So why are we returning zero? Well, no real good reason, because um, we're never going to get there anyway. Okay? It makes sense. Program straightforward, right? It's not complicated. So we save, compile, run from the command line, because we're excited that way, and we go ahead and run our program, and we see three outputs. Now, uh, if you type in this program and run it yourself, then you will obviously see different process IDs. If you run this multiple times, you will see different process IDs, because the OS is going to assign process IDs in a range, and it will reuse them eventually, and so forth. So uh, three child processes run, then five seconds go by, and remember that all the children are waiting for five seconds, and then all of them terminate right around the exact same time, five seconds in. And so you see somebody says they were reaped okay, by the parent, and then you have a second pass, and then you get a second one that is reaped, 
and then another second passes, and then nothing happens, and another second passes, and another second passes, and you're sad because you still have one more child zombie running loose, and you're, it's not doing anything, it's sitting there being boring. But it's still a zombie, right? The most boring kind of zombie ever. Okay. So if you were to look at your list of processes that are currently on the OS, you would see, hey, this thing hasn't been uh, reclaimed yet, and you'd be sad. Okay, so why is this happening? This is our source code again. What is the issue? Do you have a guess already? Yeah, yeah, we have our situation. It was exactly like we talked about last time. The signal delivery mechanism is very simple. We have a pending bit vector, one bit per signal type. We have a blocked bit vector, one bit per signal type. Okay, So we can't use this to treat signals as if they were a queue of events because they totally are not managed that way by the operating system. Okay, we have one zombie reach per sig child received. We have three child processes that terminate after five seconds. And so the kernel, on behalf of the children, is going to send three sig childs to this parent process in rapid fire succession. Okay, so think about what happens. First sig child comes in. Handle sig child is invoked. It does its thing. And then it sleeps for one second. Now we're inside of this handler, so what has happened? Well, the pending bit for sig child went to one, and then it goes to zero, and the block bit for sig child goes to one, because we're inside the handler. And then the second sig child comes flying in. So now we have the block bit is still one, and the pending bit is now one. So we have both of those bits for sig child set. And then the third sig child comes in, because that's definitely all of those three are going to come in way faster than in a second. And so what happens to the third sig child? Well, we already have a pending bit of one and a block bit of one, so it's dropped. Okay, that's what's happening here. And so then handle sig child returns, and the block bit gets cleared, and the kernel's like, ooh, 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 you have another pending bit of one, so I'm going to deliver another sig child. And now the block bit goes one, and the pending bit goes zero. So you've lost the third sig child signal. Okay. It's not that the system is poorly designed, it's that the program isn't implemented to understand the abstraction properly. Okay. That's the issue here. So, blah, blah, blah. This is basically what I just said. Parent process has sent three sig signals in a row. Um, they each take a second to handle. And remember, they're all sent right you know, lumped together, so that is what happened. First sig child received, parent uh, handles a sig child, but the sig child signal is blocked while it's handled. Second one is received, so it sets the pending bit, but it's not delivered because we're still in the first sig child call. Third sig child's received, and it's dropped. Okay? So that's basically exactly what's going on here. Um, basically, what you have to do when you write these signal handlers is look and say to yourself, okay, at least one event of this type has happened. I may need to process more than one of these occurrences if the signal is actually representing that it's happened more than once. Okay, so this is a much better sig child handler here. While one, because we're in C and we don't have true and false, which makes me cry a little, but hey. Um, while one, then what you do is you try to reap as many children as are zombies. Okay. That will eventually say you don't have any more zombies. So the process, I, the return value will either be negative if you have no children or it will be zero. I can't remember the exact distinction between, I think if it's zero, oh, I can't remember. You'd have to look at the way that the function's defined. But uh, anyway, uh, it should be positive if you got a child and so you can just say I reap these children and then when you finally run out then you just uh, return. Okay. So now this is going to be much more uh, proper in its behavior. Okay. So again, up oh yes, question, let me go back. Um, down to the last slide, what line is actually doing the, the wait for the 
Yeah, the weight PID, remember that weights or weight PID are the calls that actually reap the child. Yeah. And the other thing to recall is that when you call weight or weight PID, um, let, me, let me back up a little bit. When you call weight, it will reap any child that is terminated. Okay. So weight PID, you can actually ask it to um, wait for a particular child, or you can wait for any child, or you can wait for anyone in the group. So those are sort of the three ways that weight PID can be used. But weight will just return any child that's terminated. So it only reaches the children of the parent, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember if you are actually even allowed to wait on a non-child process. I don't believe you're allowed to wait on a non-child process. So this Unix model has certain constraints. Um, the relationship between a parent process and a child process is special. And uh, Windows doesn't have quite the same um, kind of hierarchical aspect to its process model. But uh, Unix has this um, special thing where parents and children have a special relationship. Any other questions? Okay. So yeah, like I was saying, signals indicate that at least one uh, event of a particular type has occurred, unless you're dealing with real-time uh, signals, and those tend to be a lot more resource intensive to use anyway. And I've actually never used them. I've never had a circumstance where I've needed to use them. So, uh, but then again, I do like general, um, I don't know if you would say plain vanilla systems programming, because I don't think there's any such thing. But uh, certainly not real-time system programming, so I, I don't have any familiarity with real-time signal delivery. Yes, question? Um, you said that Windows doesn't reach the same hierarchical structure. Does it still have like process ID range in it, process that starts at the start? Um, so it definitely things have process IDs. Uh, there's a Windows version of that. Um, and I would imagine that there's something, an ancestor that starts everything else. But I'm not deeply familiar with the Windows. Do you know offhand um, how familiar, I don't know how familiar you are with the Windows process oh. model. Yeah. Yeah, process monitor um, definitely will show you. Yes. Yeah. That stuff, unfortunately, I've had the uh, displeasure of actually using. Um, you might remember that uh, in Unix, when you fork, your child is an identical copy of you, except for process ID. In Windows, you can um, selectively control what is inherited. So if you, for example, want to set up a, a communication pipe between two processes, the parent can fork uh, well, again, it's not really accurate to say fork, but it's a similar concept, and you can say I'd like the child to inherit um, some of my open file descriptors and so forth. Anyway, yeah, good questions. Uh, I know that Microsoft makes a lot of their documentation available online, so that's a great place to do the research. Um, but yeah, I don't know offhand um, how the Windows bootstrap mechanism works. One thing I didn't work on at Microsoft was Windows. So, I mean, I worked on it, but I didn't work on it, if you understand what I mean. So, okay. It would be fun to talk about that, too. But that was all in the 90s, so why? Um, anyway, so uh, parents, uh, yeah, so every process has a parent process, and that has to be currently running. So if the parent dies before the child does, then the operating system basically makes the ancestor the parent of the child process. And that's just how it sets it up. And so that way, who gets the signal when the child terminates? Well, it's the ancestor process, and the ancestor can do the right thing to make sure that uh, resources, system resources are not left uh, unreclaimed. Okay. So yeah, if a process terminates while it still has zombie children, well then init gets the zombie children, and then init calls wait on the zombie children, and everything just works perfectly. So nice, simple model, and everything is taken care of eventually. Okay? So that's nice. It's pretty neat. Um, let me ask you this. Any questions about process termination? Anything like that? Yeah. Can children have their own children? Yes. Children can have children, and those children can have children. In fact, um, 
you shouldn't do this, but there's a fun program one could write if one were mischievous called a fork bomb, um, where you have a process sitting in an infinite loop forking. And then obviously those children are spun off. And guess what they do? They sit in an infinite loop forking. And, uh, you know, if you are especially um, naughty and decide to ignore all signals, then that becomes really annoying because the entire system gets overwhelmed with processes and, and becomes unusable. So uh, don't do it, kids. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, you, you know, processes can fork ad infinitum. And there's actually a limit. Like uh, every operating system will have some hard limit on how many processes that it will support. And so that's why fork has a return value, which will either be the process ID that was forked or zero if you're the child, or it will be negative if you're not allowed to fork processes or you've run out of process IDs. So. Okay, any other questions? So exec. So exec is another one of those fun functions that uh, behaves oddly. Just like fork, you call fork once and it returns twice. You call set jump once and you may see yourself returning from it numerous times if other people are calling long jump. So execve is another one of these kinds of programs where you can specify a program that you would like to load and start running and then execve is a system call. The kernel will set that up so that the program context for that process is replaced by whatever the new program is that you uh, wanted to run. Okay. Now, like I say here, the file name can either be a binary file or it can be a script. I don't know if any of you have ever used the shebang. That's what we call it. It's a hash mark and then an exclamation point, uh, a.k.a. a shebang. But you can do like hash mark, exclamation point, slash bin, slash python to make your Python program runnable from the command line. You have to set the execution bit as well. But uh, you can do that or you can do this with um, shell scripts and so forth. And basically, exec also knows how to handle that stuff. It'll look at the first line of the file. If it sees a shebang, it will use the interpreter to run the script. Okay? So that's kind of a fun thing you can do. And so you have program arguments that are provided as well. Notice char star arg v. The last element has to be null. That's how we figure out what the argument count is. And same thing with the environment. When you start a process, it has an environment. And probably all of you have seen the environment at some point in your lives when you had path issues. The path is part of what is in the environment. And uh, there can be numerous other things in there, like <laughs> Java class path. Um, I don't know. There's probably a whole bunch of other things that, that you may want to specify. Okay, So uh, environment variables are name equals value, like path equals, and then a bunch of paths. And the last element has to be null as well. So execve, when it works properly, will never return to the caller because it's replacing the program context with a new program context. Why would I return? Okay. If execve returns, it's because something sad happened. Couldn't find the program. Program isn't executable for some reason. You don't have permission. Blah, blah, blah. Those would be the reasons why execve returns. So execve only returns in error scenarios, and it doesn't return if you have a success. Yes? Yes. Um, well, so interesting. If you have open files and then you execve, um, the child process sees those, or the new, the new program sees those. This is actually really crucial. Some of you may be familiar with piping and I.O. redirection in command shells. The only way we can support that is if the child process, I'm sorry, I keep saying the child. It is not a correct statement. If the new program context sees those open files. So interestingly enough, um, exec preserves open files. But a lot of other things are replaced. Like let's say you... Um, you exec VE in a signal handler, like, uh, I got a seg fault, okay, I'm exec VE. The child process doesn't care. I'm sorry, I keep saying that. The new program doesn't care because the entire program context is reinitialized by the kernel. The memory map is reinitialized. 
the heap is reinitialized, the stack is reinitialized. So all of that is taken care of cleanly. The only thing that sticks around is open files, and that's so that you can do your I.O. Re redirection. Okay? That's how execve works at a high level. We're going to talk, I mean, it's funny because this is what, I think this is lecture 20, and it turns out that we only have like five or six more lectures, so we're getting really close to the end of the term. Um, I have for funsies lectures if you want to hear them, but, uh, you know, as far as the course material, we only have a couple more weeks of course material, so it's amazing. We're hurtling toward the end. Okay, execve kernel function. Big shock, right? We're taking a program's context and we're completely reinitializing it with other things. So it has to be a kernel operation. Okay, so this was the process context, our nice little picture on the right. We have instructions, data, we have a heap which grows up, and we have a stack which grows down. And execve is basically taking that context and reinitializing it with the new program. Okay, so new data, new instructions, maybe completely different size program. You know, you have a small program and it execs and now it's a big program. Or you have no global variables and now you have a lot. Okay, so all of that is going to be reinitialized. Okay, then execve calls the program's entry point. Now I say that that is at address 400,000 hex and it varies. There's a whole bunch of detail that we're leaving out here and I just want to make sure you're aware of that because um, again, you probably have recognized that when you write assembly code, you can put .text as the, um, how shall I say, the thing that says here are instructions and then there's other sections as well, .data and so forth if you want to have read-write data. Um, but it turns out that there's other sections as well. Like there's one that the operating system always goes to and I believe it's called .init, but don't, don't quote me on that. But that's the thing that actually calls into your main function in .text. So um, what this means is that the addresses don't have to be specifically a certain thing. They'll, they'll tend to fall into ranges. And there's a whole new technique that we've been using for quite a few years now called address space layout randomization so that values aren't always at the same address. They may be similar addresses, but they're not always going to be the same address. Um, it increases the security of a system if you don't have a single target to aim for every single time. So that's part of the reason why people have been moving in that direction. Okay, so a few details, probably more than you need, but there you go. ExecVE will call the program's entry point, and so that entry point will initialize the heap, initialize the stack, get all that stuff taken care of. Okay, so boom, those things go away as well, and they're new. Now the way that the stack is set up, there's a lot of junk that actually ends up in the new stack. You, you uh, probably don't even know that all of this stuff is there, but if you were to write a program that goes and looks at all of that information, you would discover that your stack actually has quite a bit of information. Okay? So basically, we have to store the environment, we have to store the command line arguments. If you think about it, those two things have to go somewhere. Main just sort of can magically access them. How does main access them? Well, it turns out that those things were put onto the stack before main was even invoked. So the very first thing that happens is you get all the environment variables. That's name equals value. Name equals value. A whole bunch of those are put onto the stack. You notice 2 to the 47 minus 1. So we're talking like you have 128 terabytes for your program uh, to use as far as address space. Then the actual command line argument strings are copied onto the stack. Then you get an array, basically, of addresses that point into that data. So notice NV0 points to the first environment variable, NV1 points to the second one, and so forth. We have all these pointers that allow us to access these things. The last one is null, so that you can iterate over them. And when you see null, then you know to stop. Okay. There's a special global variable. Again, um, C is a strange world. We do have global variables, although we always discourage you not to use them, right? Uh, it's one of those weird things where we say, don't use these, but then they actually are used to great 
benefit in many circumstances. So you have a special variable environ that points to that thing so that you can access them. Okay. There's functions you can use for accessing the environment variables. Again, you really don't need to know about these things unless you def decide to write your own command shell that supports environment value manipulation. Okay. Now I'll tell you that the very first assignment in 124 is to write a command shell. But we don't even require you to do environment manipulation in the command shell for 124 because it's, it's not that exciting really, honestly. Okay, next thing that is pushed onto the stack is the actual command line argument pointers. So again, argv0, does anybody remember what argv0 is always? Yes, the program name, so that you can have one program that acts like many programs. Like GCC. GCC is clever, and it can see if it was invoked as GCC or G++ or G77 or whatever, so that it can do the right thing. Okay? It's kind of fun. Uh, and then you have your various arguments also. So uh, you can see argv, argc is always set to null. So again, you can iterate over them. And then, of course, you need the main entry point set up. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing because notice I say that uh, the entry point code sets up for a call to main and then calls it, and then you have np argv argc. Now, that would be very true for cdecl. That's the old calling convention. You don't even have to know what that is, except um, that it was the IA32 calling convention. You would pass your arguments on the stack. Well, now we don't. So what we would do instead is we'd store argc into, what was it? Uh, somebody help me out. RDI? Did I get that right? I'm trying to remember the order. Yeah, RDI and then RSI and then RDX, right? Those would be the first three arguments. And so those things would be stuffed into the corresponding registers. And then main would be invoked. So main would see all of this information all carefully set up for it. Okay, everybody got that? Yay. Okay, cool. You understand how a program is started now. Okay, stack frame for main. So, um, this is basically what Unix command shells do. It's really straightforward. Um, you know, you have some program that's taking input from the user. So, user's typing things like dot slash omm perf. I don't know, maybe that comes... Uh, a little too close to home for now, but uh, anyway, you'll be able to laugh about it later. Uh, you hit enter, and then that goes into the command shell. The command shell has to decide what to do about it. Okay, so you have to parse it, figure out what is the command, um, especially if you have I.O. redirection or ampersands at the end because you want to run something in the background. So you got to do all that stuff, and then you can fork off a child process. The child process is responsible for executing the command. So notice if PID is zero, then you know you're the child. You try to exec the program. If exec does not return, hooray, the child program is running. But if exec returns for any reason, then we have sadness, so we have to go ahead and say, you know, command not found, or that's actually probably not a great thing to say because it could be many other issues as well. It could be you don't have permission. So it's a good idea to actually look at the return values and see why it failed. But then all the child does is exit because what else can it do? Its life is over. Okay? It had one job, which was to run the program, and it failed. <laughs> so it says, okay, I'll just exit. Right? So that's what the child process does here, and uh, otherwise, you're still in the parent and you fall down to the wait PID line. So that will make sure that you don't show the command prompt again before the child program is finished running. Okay? You want to obviously make sure that you wait until the child process is done before asking for another command. Alright, does that make sense? This is all the command shells do. Now another interesting detail about this is that if this is a command shell, um, clearly a command shell doesn't need to run in the kernel, right? It uses kernel operations, but it doesn't need to run in the kernel. And so that is a really good illustration of the fact that there are parts of your operating system that have to be in kernel mode. They have to run in kernel mode. That's why they call it a kernel. 
And then you have other parts of your OS that are not part of the kernel. So they run in user mode. Command shells are a great example of that. Okay. So, basic idea. Fork a child off, and then the child execs the program, and the new program will completely replace the state in the child process. Now, obviously, there's a lot of ways you can extend this idea, and real command shells do all of these things. I mean, they're really sophisticated programs that take a lot of time to engineer and to get working properly. But they're so useful, and uh, you know, there's still a lot of uh, opportunity to improve and make a lot of uh, you know, uh, neat features in, in command shells. So background processes, nice simple one. Instead of waiting for the child to terminate, you don't. You just go on to the next thing. And that would be if somebody puts an ampersand at the end of uh, your command line, then you run that in the background. That just means you don't wait for the child to terminate. Easy enough. Yes? On those last slides, um, so the line says PID equals, and that's how you check if you're in the parent or the child process. Yeah, yeah. So if you're in the parent process, what would PID be? So if you're in the parent process, that process ID is going to be some positive value. Okay. If the child was forked successfully, okay. or it will be I believe minus one if there was a failure of some kind. Okay. So that's what the parent's going to see. Recall that um, the parent process, when it forks off a child, this is the one sole way that the parent can find out the process ID of its child. There's no way to say, enumerate my child processes in the Unix process model. So you have to record this value if you care about it. <laughs> when fork hands it back. Okay, that's why the child can have uh, fork return zero, because the child can always say, what's my process ID? It can always call get pid, and it'll find out its own process ID. So if the, when the child is spawned, does it start executing? Yes. So when the parent forks off the child, they are identical, which means that the instruction pointer is also identical, which means the parent and the child will immediately start executing uh, the next lines of code following the fork call. Yeah. Any other questions? It's a pretty cool model. It's a really simple model. I like it a lot. I love simple models that are powerful. Um, yes, so questions, so sorry. The variables that were created in the parent but have to do with the ID will be changed retroactively? Like, I'm sorry, could you repeat the so, question? So you said that the two programs are identical on top of each other. Yeah. So if you do P, PID equals fork, then both of them should have the same value for no, because that PID equals part, so I guess, okay, so we need to understand that they are identical uh, contexts except for the process ID that each one has, so the parent and the child will have different process IDs. Um, the return value from fork is set by the kernel, because remember that uh, fork is a kernel system call, so you trap into the kernel, and so the kernel will duplicate the contexts, but part of that context is what is register RAX set to? And when it returns from the kernel back to the user mode uh, process, it will restore that context and that value of RAX will go into the RAX register. So what the kernel does in the system call is it makes sure that in the parent process, the RAX value that it, um, the process will see back from fork will be the child's process ID. And in the child, it'll make sure that the RAX that's restored is zero. That's, so the kernel will set all of that up in the fork system call, and that way when it goes back to the uh, child, that'll see the PID as being zero. Um, when it returns back from the parent, it'll see the PID as being the child's process ID. That's the mechanism going on there. I hope I wasn't overly sloppy with my descriptions earlier. Okay, yes, question? Because I'm thinking if you back have a process where it runs the state, then it sends out the pitch shells for the parent child. Yeah, so all of the, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember. I have slides that describe this in 124. How is the I.O. managed, you know, the I.O. redirection done here? Um, so it doesn't redirect the I.O. Before. Yes, you do have to. In fact, it's worse than that, because basically you have to set up all of the I.O. Let's say that you had a command with five, five commands. 
with four pipes. You have to set up all of that before you fork any of them, and so um, so that all of them can see the stuff. You can't sort of set up pipes and then fork a child, and then that one sets up pipes and forks another child. You have to set up all of it and then fork, and everybody sees all of the uh, file descriptors, and then you have to um, each child has to go through and close and finish up the setup for uh, the piping. Yeah, I'm going to leave it at that, and we can discuss it more after class if you're curious. Um, but there's various system calls that allow you to replace the standard in, standard out uh, file descriptors and so forth. We talk about all this in 124 because it's important. But it's not right now. Okay, let's see. What else were we talking about? Background, built-in commands. Um, so, yeah, you can always check to see if the command specified is something that's built in. Like setN is a great example. Change directory turns out to have to be implemented as a built-in command for a very basic reason. Exit also has to be built in. Uh, so, like, you can see in, like, slash bin, I think it is, you'll have ls and, and um, a whole bunch of other things, more or less, all of those kinds of things are there. Um, but you have certain commands that have to be built in. And so the shell can just check for those things and update its internal state instead of forking. And then, of course, IO redirection, like we were discussing, um, definitely can be implemented uh, Yes, that is still a correct statement. Child processes can change standard in and standard out file descriptors before executing. Okay. Any other questions? We're going to, hopefully not, <laughs> right? We kind of beat this one to death. But like I said, I'm happy to talk about this more um, afterward if you're curious. Um, let's see. Yeah, no error checking, which sucks. Terrible idea to not error check. Things could fail for all kinds of reasons. So, uh you would need to add various functionality for this. There is a, a section of the textbook that talks about command shells. So you can read about it. It um, basically is as complex as what I've shown you in these slides. So it doesn't do any of the more sophisticated features. Although I think that it suggests those as um, additional problems if you want to do programming problems. Okay? Or you could just wait till 124 and do it in that class as well because it's the first assignment. Okay. Um, Let's see, anything else that I, is, are there any other questions about this? All right, so let's see. We have this uh, kind of pretty picture, which I liked, um, that was in the Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment book. That's a great book. If you happen to do Unix system programming at any point in your life, you'll probably want to get a, a copy of that book. We abbreviated APU, um, A-P-U-E, and... Uh, it's just a really fantastic book talking about all the vagaries of how this stuff works. So if you write Unix server software, it's like your best friend. Okay. So exec VE, obviously, the kernel is returning to a brand new process context, which is why we draw it here. Obviously, this program was forked, so uh, you know that would have happened earlier. Uh, you have startup routine, which then calls main. Main can call various functions. Those functions will hopefully eventually return. You don't run over your stack limits. And then main eventually returns, and you go back to your startup routine. Any of those can call exit. And then you're in the exit function, and that will run your exit handlers. Remember, you can do add exit, and that will register various handlers uh, if you want to do shutdown hooks. And then uh, you have standard I.O. cleanup. So things are closed up at the end of your program. And then you have... Another special one called underscore exit, which actually avoids all the shutdown hooks. You can look this up if you're curious, but you can invoke under, uh, underscore uh, exit if you want to skip all the exit handlers. Okay, and then that'll go back to the kernel and so forth. Of course, any of these other things could do that as well. All right, so that's a simple um, sort of, um, yeah, it's a pretty high-level conceptual sketch of what can happen here. All right, so Unix process model, yay, we can cover it in a lecture and a half, right? So you can see that it's pretty uh, simple. We're going to start talking about something a little bit more sophisticated now because we've talked about how to start processes, how we handle termination, and blah, blah, blah. Um, we can build some neat things with it. We can build an interactive shells. It turns out you can build web servers. You can build other fun, clever pieces of software. Um, so that's neat, but... That's all on the outside, and the whole point of CS24 is to understand how these things work. And so what we're going to start doing is talk about how this stuff is actually implemented. 
Okay. Now, you are not going to be required to implement an entire Unix process model. Um, we actually give you quite a bit of uh, you know, what that implementation would look like in assignments 6 and 7. So you'll see a sketch of what it could look like, but then you would have to take 124 if you really want to see how it works. Um, we're going to have a high-level discussion of this stuff, though. Okay. We're going to go over it, and you're going to get to see some of the interesting details of it. It turns out that the actual state diagram that is implemented by the operating system is much more complex than these three simple states we had. Running, stopped, terminated. Remember, that was our three states. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm saying right here. Um, we can only run one process per CPU. We're not, we're not, I mean, there is a kind of magic going on here, but we're still bound by the laws of reality. So if we have four CPUs, we can run four programs. We can't run five. We have to run no more programs than we have CPUs. So clearly we need to keep track of the ones that are not running, but could if they were given a CPU. Okay. So we have to be able to distinguish between running and ready to run. Okay, because we could also have programs in other states, depending on what they're doing. So um, we could also have a situation where programs are making a long-running system call. They stupidly decided to read data from the user, and we know that's going to take a while. Okay, Or they're reading from a file, and we know that'll take a lot of time, but it will eventually come back. Okay, So we have another state which is blocked. And basically, we keep track of the fact that this program is waiting for something to happen, and it's going to take a long time, so don't even consider it for scheduling. Okay? In fact, we can be even more clever, and we can say that this program is blocked on some device. And so you can keep track of what programs are blocked on, so that when the disk controller fires an interrupt and says, hey, there's disk data, we don't go look at the programs that are waiting on keyboard input. Why? Right? Or network input. Why even look at those? We can look just at the programs that are blocked on the disk. So you can imagine that there would be multiple blocked queues. We can also stop them. So we can say, I'd like to not schedule this program anymore. And so control Z is a nice simple way of doing that. That sends the T stop, terminal stop signal to the program. And now the kernel will stop scheduling it. Okay, and then you can send another signal to um, cause it to uh, continue running. So we can stop processes, but remember they can also be blocked. It could be blocked on I.O. when I stop it, or it could be blocked on disk I.O. when I stop it. And then, of course, it could become unblocked while it's stopped. And so this clearly also complicates the picture. So let me just show you this really quickly. And then we'll wrap up for the day. We have one process running per CPU. Then we have other processes that if they had a CPU, they could totally run, but they don't have a CPU. And so those are in another category called ready. And so remember our timer interrupt? We have a timer tick occur, and the kernel steps in and says, OK, program, you've had enough time on the processor. We're going to kick you out of running and back into ready. And then some software has to run inside the kernel to say, this program that's ready to run should run next. And so it'll pick out one, and that will transition from ready to running. Okay? So there's a lot of fun things going on just in that little part of the picture. We'll talk about some of that. Now, a running program could do something silly like a system call to read from the user, or read from a disk, or read from the network. So if it does that, it becomes blocked. So it now enters into this state. We keep track of what it's blocked on so that we can unblock it efficiently. Um, when the resource becomes available, whatever it is, then we go from blocked back to ready because now it could run if it had a CPU, but we're not going to just hand it the CPU right away. And so it has to go back into the ready queue. You know, There may be a higher priority program running, so we don't want to just kick it off the processor. So we put it back in the ready state and it will eventually get back on the processor and do its thing. Now, if we stop a process, 
It, remember, it could be ready or it could be blocked. Then we will move it into a corresponding suspended state. Okay. So you can see how that would work. Again, pretty straightforward. And then finally, we may have a process that is running, but then eventually it needs to terminate. Now, you could look at this in a lot of different ways. Go from blocked to terminated, ready to terminated, ready suspended to terminated. But we keep it really simple because, remember, there's always some cleanup that kind of has to happen on behalf of the process. So we just say you go from running to terminated. Okay? Any questions about the state diagram? Not every operating system will have exactly the state diagram. Not every operating system will have suspended states. Unix happens to have those for a specific historical reason, which I don't have time to tell you at this moment. Maybe I'll tell you next time. But uh, it's kind of cool. So uh, you, we definitely talk about it in 124, but we don't talk about it right now. Okay, so are there any questions? Let me see what we say here. Yeah, so um, blah, blah, blah. Let me just uh, go ahead and throw this up here. So basically what we'll do next time is continue this discussion of how the Unix process model is implemented. So we'll see you whenever.